excited to be here. Thank you for joining us today on this presentation called The Art of Successful Aesthetic Case Presentation. So the first question and the main question that almost every dentist asks is, what can we do to increase case acceptance? Now, we often diagnose all these cases, but we can't really communicate with the lab. We can't really communicate with the patient. And there's a connection there that's missing that's not allowing us to complete all these cases that we diagnose. So even though we're diagnosing dentistry, we're not really practicing all the dentistry that we would like. So we're gonna go a little bit over the outline of this course. It's gonna be a two part webinar. The first part is gonna be focused on photography, the Lumi smile, digital smile design, the equipment that we need to take these photographs you're gonna be able to see. And the main thing is going to be the camera adjustments. How do we adjust the camera? How do we stop taking photographs with just that dial on the auto that every camera has? The second part is going to be the art technique. So the art technique is a new technique developed by Denmat, which stands for Additive Reductive Template. So the Additive Reductive Template, what it does is that it allows us to create all these cases and actually show the patient with a trial smile or provisionals that the patient can see before we even start the case. So this is very important because once the patient sees what their final veneers are gonna look like, the case acceptance just shoots through the roof. And we're gonna go over the technique. We're gonna give you a case example now this case example is gonna be a short video that's gonna go from the veneer preparation using the art templates all the way to the provisionalization of the trial smile. So the patient will go from preparing all the way up to where he will leave with a trial smile that's actually bonded while he waits for the lumineers to be de delivered by the lab. So the first part is gonna be photography. So photography is an essential tool for every case. Why? Because we wanna capture in the camera what the eye sees. So if we can transmit that to a screen, to an iPhone or an Android, and give that to the patient, we're gonna be able to connect a lot better with them. Now that's for the patient. Now for the lab, if we don't send the lab photographs, we can write down any amount of instructions that we want, we can tell them, exactly where we want, uh, let's say a shade, an A1 or an A2. But if we don't show them photographs, there's so much information that's missing. So a picture does speak uh, a thousand words. And that's what we wanna be able to communicate with the lab and also with the patients. So photography is a great tool that's gonna be able to give us that three-way communication between clinician, patient, and also the lab. And once those three people connect, then we can have great case acceptance. So the first part is gonna be taking high quality photographs. When we take a, a high quality photograph, like the one that we see right here with this patient, we're able to send this to the lab and we're gonna be able to communicate exactly what it is that we want. So I wanna introduce this concept that's offered by Denmat. This is called the Lumi Smile. So what a Lumi Smile does is that we take a high quality photograph of a patient, we send this photograph to the lab, and within 20 minutes, give or take 20 minutes, they're gonna send us back these two photographs that you see on the right-hand side. So the middle photograph is the Lumi smile. Now the Lumi smile is what the patient would look like if we did a full rehab with lumineers. On the right side, further on the right, we're gonna see the Lumi smile white. So this is what the patient would look like if we just did whitening. So just by showing this to the patient, I guarantee that the case acceptance is gonna shoot through the roof again. So why? Because this patient has never seen their smile like this. And this isn't just for patients who walk into your office saying, doctor, I wanna fix my smile. I want lumineers, I want veneers, not just for them. This is for every single patient that you have in your office. Why? Because we can take a photograph for every patient in less than 10 seconds, get them in the room, click, send this to the lab, and within 20, 30 minutes, we're gonna be able to have this Lumi smile that the patient can actually take home. So you're able to print this, give this to the patient, and I guarantee you that once they see this in their hands, they're gonna want something done. Maybe they're not ready to get veneers all the way yet, but they will be ready to at least do uh, whitening. And that's gonna be able to increase rapport with the patients, and you're gonna have a better communication, better understanding, and definitely a better relationship with them 
that in the future, when they want to fix their smile, they know that you're going to be the one that's going to give that to them. So another case, this is also another Lumi smile case that we ended up doing. So the patient came in, wasn't really happy with the smile. We ended up doing a Lumi smile, quick photograph, send it to the lab, and they came back with these results. So we're going to see this case at the end of the, the presentation. But I just want to show you the difference that a high quality photograph makes. When we take high quality photographs, we're able to see the details of the teeth, we're able to see the smile line, we're able to see the lip line. And with this, the lab is going to be able to give us these two sets of slides, the Lumi smile and the Lumi smile white. So again, if the patient takes this home with them, they're going to have an emotional attachment to this photograph because they've never seen themselves with this smile. They know they want to fix the smile, but they really don't know exactly how or even if it's possible. So with this patient, we're able to give them the Lumi smile and they're definitely going to come back and want some veneers done. Another case, this patient right here that shows us that we don't really just do veneers. So we're dentists that are interested in the entire mouth, but the Lumi smile is able to communicate that with the patient. So if you can see on the upper right of the patient, there's two teeth missing, which is four and five. We did the Lumi smile, we send it to the lab, we give it back to the patient, and the patient didn't really think that that was noticeable until we actually took the photograph. So this patient that has two implants on four and five, they have Lumisier crowns on top of those implants and a full set of new lumineers on the rest of the teeth. So the patient goes really, really happy with this because once they take something home, they become emotionally attached. And when you're emotionally attached to something, that is what makes people act. So patients will act based on emotions. If we can get a patient emotionally invested in their smile, I guarantee you that they're gonna come to you asking for treatment. So now to get on with photography, the first question that everyone asks is, Canon versus Nikon. Which one is better? Which one is the best thing? What can we do? Does it make a difference? And the short answer is no, it does not make a difference. What matters is going to be the adjustments, the lights, and the lenses. All the cameras that are out there are really, really good. The difference is going to be how many bells and whistles they come with. So if you get a Canon 80D, that's the newest Canon, that one is just going to have Wi Fi, it's going to have a touch screen a little better sensor and small things that really don't make such a big difference because again, the photograph isn't made with the camera by itself. We need to understand that it's the lenses, the lights and the adjustments. So hopefully by the end of this tutorial, this webinar, you're gonna be able to have a little bit of a better understanding of what all these settings mean. So lenses, there's two types of lenses that we can get for a Canon and two types that we can get for a Nikon in order to get these great intraoral photographs. So the first one is going to be the Canon Macro 100, and the second one is the Canon 60 millimeter. So both of these lenses are prime lenses. So it's 160 on the Canon, and it's 105 and 85 on the Nikon. So again, both of these lenses are really good lenses. The only difference is how much distortion each one is going to have. So for intraoral photography, I definitely recommend getting the 100 or the 105 for the Nikon because that's what's gonna give us the best ratio for the teeth. It's gonna give us a one-to-one -one ratio and it's gonna give us really, really good focus on those teeth that we want. The next thing that we need to speak about is lights. We have to have an external light source in order to have great photographs. If we don't have that, our settings are always gonna be messed up. We're either gonna be taking blurry photos or dark photos, and that's not something that we want. So it doesn't matter what type of light that you want, and we can go over the difference in each one of them. But the easiest one to use by far is going to be the ring flash. What the ring flash does is sends full light, but it's going to be all around the lens. So that's going to be able to give us light all the way to the back of the teeth. The second one is going to be the twin flash. The twin flash is a little bit at a 45 degree angle, so the light's going to be a little bit softer. You're going to have a little bit of a shadow on some of the teeth, but it's still going to be a great light. And for the third and my favorite are gonna be speed lights. So speed lights, these are gonna be hooked onto a bracket. And then with the bracket, we're also gonna put some diffusers on it. And this is gonna give us by far the softest light. So if you don't wanna have a harsh light, you need to have some speed lights and have the lights coming in at 45 degree angles to the patient. And we're gonna get some accurate and really, really soft light on those teeth with minimal reflection. 
adjustments. Now, this is probably the scariest slide in the presentation and what throws most people off. So whenever we have a DSLR camera or a new professional camera, we see all these different icons. And honestly, they can be intimidating because we don't understand what they all do. So I want you to go ahead and forget about all that. And you, we were gonna understand the three main ones, which is gonna be ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. So the ISO is the sensitivity that the sensor has to light. Shutter speed, it's how fast the shutter actually stays open and then closes. And the aperture is the amount that that diaphragm is gonna open on that lens. So those are the three things, the three adjustments that we're gonna be dealing with. And we're gonna go one by one on the next few slides. We also wanna take in consideration the format of the photo, which is gonna be either JPEG or RAW, the white balance, and also the exposure. So we're gonna go a little bit into detail on that, but I want you to just focus on the first three which is ISO, which is sensitivity to light, shutter speed, and aperture. Okay, so the first one, ISO. So what does the ISO do? ISO is the sensitivity to light that the sensor actually has. And if it's really, really low, that means that the sensitivity to light for the sensor is not gonna be accounted for by the software in the camera. If it's really high, then that means that the, actually that the sensor is gonna be doing a lot of that filling in for that black shadows that we have. So the first thing that we do whenever we have a photograph at night, when we take it with the phones, is that they're going to be really, really dark. So when they're dark, what the phone does is that it increases the sensitivity to light by using software, but it is going to give us this graininess to it, like we see on the right. So a low ISO, which is at ISO 100, is going to give us really, really, really sharp image, but it's going to be also dark if we don't have an external light source. Now, if we have an external light source, we're not gonna have this problem because we're gonna have plenty of light. So again, I want you to all to take a photograph at night with your iPhones or with um, your Samsungs. Take a photograph at night and you'll be able to see that since there's not enough light available, the sensor is gonna increase that ISO and it's gonna make the picture brighter, but you are gonna have all this noise to the photograph. So we would definitely wanna avoid that at all costs whenever we take an intro oral photography. The next setting is shutter speed. So shutter speed, again, is how fast the shutter opens and closes, how long the shutter actually stays open. So a slow shutter speed is gonna give us a lot of light. A, a fast shutter speed is gonna give us low light. The advantage of a high shutter speed is that it will capture the moment and really, really sharp. So if someone's moving, you're gonna be able to capture that when you have a high shutter speed. If something's moving, but you have a slow shutter speed, then that's gonna give us a blurry image. So in the left side, you can see that this photograph was taken at shutter speed one over 100th of a second, but it was dropping. So that gives us something blurry. If we take it at one over 250th of a second, now we have a sharp image. So I don't really want you to deal too much with this because the shutter speed cannot be increased more than one over 250th of a second. If we increase it more than that, then it's not going to be able to synchronize with the external flashes. So if we want it to connect to the external flashes, the highest we can go is 1 over 250. If we go any higher than that, any faster than that, then we're going to have a dark line because the, the flashes aren't going to be able to shoot fast enough. So I want you to just do yourself a favor and just always set the shutter speed at 1 over 200th of a second. So at one over 200, that's gonna give us a really fast shutter speed. So if the patient moves a little or if we're holding the camera and we move a little bit, it's not gonna matter because the image is still gonna be really sharp. But it's not gonna be fast enough to where the flashes won't be able to synchronize to it. So again, the shutter speed, just leave it always at one over 200th of a second and just don't mess with that. So we're only gonna mess with the other two settings, which is the ISO and the aperture. So aperture, aperture is by far my favorite setting in the cameras, just because it does so much. So we've all heard about f-stop and the f-stop, all that it means is how much the aperture is either open or closed. So this is inverted, a really small number. So a number one would mean that a big opening on the diaphragm of the camera, a really high number or a high f-stop means that the camera is actually uh, has a diaphragm that's really, really closed. Okay. so what's the difference with this like why does it matter if it's open and closed well if you can see right here 
we can see that this is at f-stop 2.8. So what happens is that the camera only focuses on those two central teeth. Every teeth in the back is not going to be in focus. It's going to allow a lot of light to come in to the picture, but only one little piece of the photograph is going to be in focus. So this can be seen in portrait photography when someone's taking pictures of people outside, and you can see that the whole background is blurred. The reason why it's blurred is because that f-stop is really low. So at 2.8, the f-stop only allows a camera to focus on the small spot. At f11, we can see that we can focus a little bit more. We can focus on four teeth now. And at f32, everything is going to be in, in focus. So the advantage of aperture is having depth of field. Okay, so aperture is connected to depth of field. But remember, if we have a lot of depth of field, which is what we want in intraoral photography, look at the diaphragm. The diaphragm is closed. So compared to f1 or f2.8, you see the diaphragm in f32 is really, really, really small. So what that means is that less light is going to be coming in. Okay, so if you ever take a photograph without external flashes, you're going to have to have a low f-stop. If you have a high f-stop, then that means the aperture is going to be closed, not enough light is going to be coming in, and what that's going to give you, it's going to give you a dark image. So we want to avoid that by having external flashes. If we have external flashes, then that's not going to be a problem. So this is just an example at f-stop f22 and aperture f3.5 in the bottom. So what we can see is that at the bottom, the f-stop is at 3.5, which is not going to give us that depth of field. You can see that the teeth in the back are all blurred. So that's something that we want to avoid. So we, we don't want to have this in our photography in, in the clinic. So if you take a picture without using external flashes with your camera and you just take the automatic setting that every camera has, you're more than likely going to get a picture like this, where the front teeth are going to be in focus or one tooth is going to be in focus, but everything in the back is going to be blurred out. So in order to avoid that, we want to increase the f-stop. So if we increase the f-stop to f22, like we see in this picture, we can see that the depth of field dramatically increases, okay? Now, what we don't see in this picture is the flashes. So the flash power in this photograph was really, really low. And in this photograph, the flash power was really, really high. Why? Because if we don't have high flash power, we're not going to have enough light. Because remember, the aperture closes at high f-stop. So if, if the aperture closes, if the diaphragm closes at high f-stop, that means less light is coming in, which means we have to compensate that with the external flashes. So just to recap, ISO, we want to keep the ISO low so we don't have any graininess. The f-stop, we want to have a high f-stop in order to have that depth of field. And the shutter speed, just always leave the shutter speed at 1 over 200 of a second. So now speaking about adjustments that we have in the camera, we have something that says RAW and JPEG. So these are two different formats. So the difference between these two different formats is that the RAW format is going to give us so many more pixels like we see right here. So these are just pixels of a photograph compared to the JPEG where there's a lot of pixels actually missing. The advantage of having a RAW photograph is that if your light is off, if the picture is too dark or if it's too bright, then you can easily adjust for that or compensate for that if you have all this information in there. If you have a JPEG photo only, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to adjust for any mistakes that we had during the shooting of the photograph. So the benefit of having a raw format is gonna be that you have a lot of information and all that information, you're gonna be able to process it. So if you made any mistake, which we all do all the time, we are gonna be able to compensate for that by adjusting it either in Photoshop or in other editing software. The disadvantage of shooting in RAW is that if you can see the size, is this is a 25 megabyte file, as opposed to a JPEG, which is only like around four to five megabytes. So the disadvantage that a RAW file has is that it takes up too much memory space. So if you're gonna be shooting in RAW, just be sure to get a memory card that's around 128 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes, just so you're not running out of space. So you're going to be able to take a lot of photographs with a 64 gigabyte memory card. The next stuff that we're going to talk about, the next slide we're going to talk about is going to be white balance. So white balance is how hot or how warm or cool the temperature in the photograph is. So if you can see at 35 degrees Kelvin, it's going to be a really, really cool light. If we increase that, 
to 760, it's going to be really warm. So what we want to have is we want to have a temperature that's neutral, that's in the middle, that's something that is pleasing to the eye. And that temperature is going to be 5560. So most cameras now, you can adjust them to have a specific temperature of the photograph in the settings. Now, if you don't have this in, in your camera and you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't matter because as long as you're shooting in RAW, again, we have so much information that you can just Photoshop the temperature that you want. So whenever I shoot in RAW, the first thing I do when I'm processing my photographs in Photoshop is that I just adjust the temperature to 5,560 degrees Kelvin. And that's gonna give us the correct temperature. That's gonna give us the correct temperature that the eye sees. And it's gonna be the most pleasing to anyone who sees a photograph. Next is gonna be the exposure. So every camera has a histogram. It's usually overlooked and it shouldn't be overlooked because remember, we're taking the photograph and we wanna see exactly what the data is giving us. So every camera now has an LCD screen in the back and we can take a photo and we can see it and we'll see, oh, maybe it's too dark or maybe it's too bright or is it in focus or not. But if we don't look at the histogram, then we're gonna be missing out on a lot of information. So the information that the histogram gives us is gonna be if it's gonna be underexposed, like we see on this area, overexposed, like we see in this photograph, or ideal exposure like we see in this middle one. So what does the histogram mean? The histogram is gonna capture the pixels, which are re represented by these lines, and where they're located on the dark to light scale. So the dark is gonna be the left side and the light is gonna be the right side. So if all the pixels are shifted to the left, that means this is a dark photograph like this one we see here. If we see that the pixels are all in the middle, or distributed evenly, then that means that the exposure on the photograph is actually correct. If we see that the pixels are off to the right, then that means that it's overexposed. So in order to avoid all of this, we want to always take a look at the histogram because sometimes again, in the LCD screen that we have in, in the back of our cameras, we can't really tell if it's underexposed or if it's overexposed. But if we look at the histogram, then we're gonna be able to either adjust the settings with the ISO or the flash power or the aperture. Okay, so accessories. Accessories are very important. In order to get high quality photographs, we have to have at least three essential accessories. The first one is gonna be retractors. So we have to have retractors because we don't wanna have our fingers retracting the cheeks of a patient. So if you have good case presentation, we have to have good photographs and that's gonna increase the case acceptance. Photographs like this one right here, where we can see that all the teeth, we can see that the cheeks are retracted, there's no fingers in the way, there's no gloves, there's no blood, and there's no saliva. So in order to take a photograph like this one, we wanna put the, those cheek retractors, pull the, the cheeks out of the way, make sure that we see everything that's in focus, we wanna see uh, everything that's well exposed, but if we don't have these tools, we're not gonna be able to do that. The next is gonna be the mirrors. So not all mirrors are created equal. The mirrors that we have to have are either titanium, rhodium, or chromium. Okay, so no stainless steel mirrors. The reason for that is because stainless steel does not reflect enough light. So if we don't reflect all that light, we're gonna be missing out on all that extra data that we have for our photograph. Everything's either gonna be dark or it's gonna be blurry or something that gets scratched. So you have to hide high quality mirrors, either titanium, rhodium, or chromium. The best ones are gonna be the titanium mirrors, but they're also the most expensive you can get high quality photographs with either rhodium or chromium mirrors. And that's, that's usually what I have in my office. It's either rhodium or chromium mirrors. They're gonna give you great photographs, really, really good reflection of light, and you're not gonna have any problems. Finally, it's gonna be contrasters. So the contrasters is gonna give us that black background behind our teeth. So this is a picture with and without a contraster. This is not Photoshop, same patient, same day, with a contrastor and without the contrastor. So if we wanna focus on either the top teeth or the bottom teeth, we can take this contrastor, put it behind the patient and take the photograph. Here's another picture of the lowers. So this patient never paid attention to the lowers. She didn't really care about that diastema that she has right there. But once we took this photograph and showed her that, then she said, you know what? I wanna get that fixed. And I also wanna get those chips fixed. So this is the importance of a contrastor. If you take a photograph, without a contrastor, if you take a photograph that's not focused well, that's not exposed well, the patients aren't going to do the treatment that you tell them to do because there's really nothing that they see wrong with them. But if you show them, if you can communicate 
by using your camera and capturing what the eye can see, then you're going to be able to communicate with the patient. You're going to be in a spot where you can tell them, you know what, this is what's going on in your mouth, and this is how we can fix it. So with this patient, we can either do uh, lumineers right there with no prep, or we can do a composite, um, or we can even uh, have ortho. So there's, there's all this treatment that can be done, but if we diagnose, but the patient doesn't communicate with us, then that connection is lost, and they're not going to get treatment. So finally, the page that everyone wants to know, it's the settings. So what settings do we use for photography? So we have two different types of photography. We have portrait photography and intraoral photography. And I want you to just focus on these first three settings right here. Remember, aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. Remember, shutter speed, we're always going to leave it at 1 over 200th of a second. Okay, so this doesn't change. Don't change this because really it's not worth it. Just leave it at one over 200 in a second. This, you're always gonna have really good photographs if you know how to change the ISO and the aperture. So the aperture, when we're taking a portrait, we're gonna take it at F11. Everything is gonna be in focus and ISO 200. So the only thing that's gonna change is the flash power that you're gonna have on your external flashes. Because remember, we have to have external flashes. For intraoral photography, we wanna have F-stop F22, ISO 200, and shutter speed 1 over 200. So just remember the rule of twos. For intraoral photography, just use all twos. F22, ISO 200, shutter speed 1 over 200. And the format, I always like shooting in raw, and also the white balance at 5,560 degrees Kelvin. So just a few examples of portrait photography and what your portrait photography should look like. It should be like this. There's even soft light coming from the edges. Everything's in focus. And we want to have that black background. And the way we have that black background is by not just having a black wall, but actually having the light only hit the patient. So if you're locating the soft boxes at 45 degrees, if we have these flashes at 45 degrees, they're not going to be hitting that background. And if the background is not lit up, then it's going to be dark. So if we want to have photographs like this, we want to be sure to have external flashes and understand that the settings have to be at F11, ISO 200, 1 over 200. And again, these aren't set in stone. You can increase the f-stop a little bit more. You can increase the ISO if you see that your image is a little too dark, or you can increase the flash power. We can also have this type of photography where we can have a completely white background. So in order to have a white background, this we actually need a third light, and the third light is going to go behind the patient. But the settings remain the same. F-stop 11, ISO 200, and shutter speed 1 over 200. Now, intraoral photography, the intraoral photography that we want to achieve is something like this, where everything's in focus all the way to the back molars, okay? We want to make sure that everything is in focus because if we can see some decay right here and we can communicate that with the patient, then they're going to be able to get the, that treatment done. But if we can't communicate what we see on the photographs with the patient, then they're more than likely not going to want to get treatment because they're going to just put it off. But if they see that they have the cave, they see that we're actually taking the time to share this with them, it's very, very likely they're going to accept your treatment plan and your case acceptance, again, is just going to increase higher and higher. So this is another uh, photography that we took. This is also in Toro. So again, I want you to take a look at the settings in this one. So the settings here did change a little bit. So remember, the starting point is going to be that rule of twos, f-stop at 22, ISO 200, and shutter speed 1 over 200. So what changed right here? The ISO. And the reason why it changed right here was because my assistant, when she was taking this photograph, she saw that the on the histogram that it was a little too dark. So what she did was that she went ahead and just increased the ISO to 400, and by doubling the ISO, that sensitivity of the sensor to light, we were able to get a high quality photograph. So again, I'll leave you with the last page of the settings. But right now, let's go on to the part two, which is actually going to be the additive reductive template technique. So a little background, the additive reductive template technique was made because patients want to have minimally invasive dentistry. And that's what we have to offer. We have to offer responsible aesthetics. So there's no point of having a great smile if you reduce the teeth just all the way down to the dentin. So the art technique allows you to create these great cases with minimal reduction. So the main communication problem that we have with the lab is going to be reduction. So as minimally invasive dentists, we usually don't want to reduce anything or even do no prep veneers. But the lab always wants more and more space in order for them to do the veneers that they want so they're aesthetic. 
So how do we compromise? The way we compromise is by getting the exact measurements that we want. We want to reduce only the bare minimum that the lab can do. So if you partner up with a lab that can actually deliver this, again, your case acceptance is going to go to the roof. Why? Because we're going to practice responsible aesthetics. We're going to be reducing minimally on those teeth. We're going to conserve the most tooth enamel. And that's also going to be very, very beneficial when it comes to bonding those veneers. So the steps, very easy. First step, you're going to have to be able to take diagnostic impressions. So we take photographs and impressions. So this is going to be the first time that the patient comes to our office and we're going to be able to send this to the lab for some wax up. So first we take impressions. Second, we do a wax design. So I'm really involved in my designs. You don't have to be. Dan Matt does great, great job with all the wax ups. I like to just give them a little bit more guidance to see exactly what it is that I want. And they're really good with the communication. So if we send Dan Matt these impressions and we send them these photographs, then we can actually digitally design the smile. And again, this is an extra step that's not necessary, but it is very beneficial. And it is something that I do just because I, I feel more comfortable telling the lab exactly what it is that I want, even though they're very capable and they know exactly what the aesthetic should look like, not all patients are the same. So after I discuss the patient, what their expectations are, um, what type of centrals that they want, what type of smile they want, I actually designed this in, in the computer and I'll show you how good the lab is at following the directions that we give them. So it's gonna be a short video showing how the wax design is made from my digital design. Okay, so if we can see the wax, how, how good it is, actually how they, good they are following that design down to the millimeter, down to the half a millimeter. So whenever I take these photographs, I tell the lab, you know what, I want half a millimeter more on the incisal, or maybe I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, gingivectomy. And they're really good at following all that. So why is this so important? It's important because this is gonna be the smile that your patient is gonna see. When the lab sends you this wax design, they're not just gonna send you a wax design. They're gonna send you a wax design, they're gonna send you the templates, and they're gonna send you a guide for you to actually do something called a trial smile. So this guide is gonna be a clear matrix, and you're gonna be able to show your wax up on the patient, and you're gonna be able to actually show them what their veneers are gonna look like, what the shape is gonna be like. The only thing that's gonna be different is gonna be the material. So the material is gonna be uh, whatever it is that you choose, whether it's serenade, whether it's lithium silicate, whatever it is that you choose, but the shape, the form, the texture is gonna be similar to what you're gonna be able to deliver them that same day. So this is what you receive from the lab. You're gonna receive three types of models. The first model is gonna be the wax up, which is this right here. So this wax up, was made by you and the lab. You communicate with each other. You say how long you want those teeth, how wide. So these teeth were 11 and a half by nine millimeters, which is what we discussed with the patient that she wanted. And they're gonna send you this so you can actually show the patient, you know what, this is what your design is. And at the end is gonna be that guy that I was speaking to you about, that clear matrix. So this clear matrix, we're gonna be able to take it, put it in the patient's mouth and show the patient how their smile actually would be. The next set of models they're gonna send you are gonna be just the regular models, but it's gonna be with these templates. So these are the additive reductive templates. So what's so important about these? So if you can see there's, on this case, there was three templates. It can be more, it can be one, it can be depending on how complex your case is, it can be either one, two, three, or as many are, as are needed to guide you through the preparation for your veneers. So the first template we see down here is only for the incisal reduction. So we can see some incisal reduction done right here. After we do the incisal reduction, then we're gonna do the facial reduction, which is right here. And then the interproximal reduction, which is right here, okay? So what I really, really want you to look at is how minimally invasive this is. So it's very, very rare that someone's gonna be able to just see a patient and say like, I want exactly half a millimeter 
reduced right here, half a millimeter reduced right here. It's going to be really, really difficult to do that. Why? Because we don't know what the lab wants. We don't know what to expect. We don't know if that's even possible. We don't know how thin the, the veneers have to be. We don't know if we can actually accomplish that. We don't know if they're going to look funny in the patient's mouth. So what we want to have is we want to have this wax up. And with this, we have the exact dimensions that we're going to need. We're going to have the exact reduction that's going to be needed. And this is definitely something that we have to show our patients. We have to show them, you know what? This is how much reduction we're actually going to do. So very, very little reduction. And this patient, she did not have to be numb. And the reason for that is because there was only preparation done on the enamel. So no dentin was touched in this case. Now, if you can see the bottom, these are the models. This is before they were prepped. So there's a diastem right here that the previous dentist had tried to close with some composites. So we just took that off. And then the only thing we did was reduce on the facial and then the incisal. So you have another model that's going to be sent to you, which is this one right here. This is going to serve you as a guide. So whatever is yellow, as in right there, that's going to be the facial reduction. The incisal reduction is already going to be covered. We want a little bit of a bevel. And then the orange is going to be the freehand. So you can see that it's going to be very, very minimal reduction. So the patient can be confident that her teeth are being taken care of because we're practicing responsible aesthetics. Finally, and the most important thing that the patient is going to care about is going to be the trial smile. So this matrix, this clear matrix, is going to be used to do some temporary veneers. And this is what it looks like inside the patient's smile. So it's a clear matrix. It's going to show you exactly how well it's going to seat on the patient. And what it's going to do, it's going to transform that smile to something very, very similar to how it would look like when the veneers are actually delivered. So if you can see at the bottom left, that's on the wax up. That's how it sits on the wax up. And on the right, bottom right, that's without the wax up. So once we place this in the patient, all we have to do is take some perfect temp or any temporary material that you like. We inject it into the matrix, and then we just place the matrix on top of the teeth. No reduction is done. The teeth aren't touched at all at this point. So we show that to the patient, and this is the result that we get. So again, these are only temporaries. This is only a trial smile. This is only what the patient can see. So no tooth structure was touched at this point. No tooth structure was touched at all at this point. So that's really important because the patient is going to see this transformation from this to this immediately. And the great thing about this is that it's not bonded. So the patient can actually go home with this. And it usually falls about within a day or two, or if they eat something crunchy or if they just take them off themselves. But again, it's only a trial. So the patient goes home, they show this to their loved ones, they show this to their spouse. And the importance about this trial smile is that we're creating an emotional investment with the patient. Again, emotions make people act. If we create an emotional investment with this patient on his smile, it's very, very likely that they're going to act on it. So again, this is going to increase your case acceptance. But you don't only show this to the patient, you just also take a photograph of it. Because if you take a photograph of it, you're going to show the patient, you know what? This is what we have right now, and this is what we need to do to accomplish this smile. So with high-quality photographs, you're going to be able to communicate with the patient. With high-quality photographs, you're going to be able to communicate with the lab. If the patient doesn't like something, Let's say he doesn't like something about this trial smile. He wants these teeth to be longer. He wants these teeth to be shorter. Well, then we can just reduce that in the trial smile or add a little bit of flowable composite in the trial smile. And then we take an impression and we send this to the lab. So if you have a lab that can communicate with you, if you have a lab that's going to understand the case all the way from the beginning, from the photographs to the trial smile, then you're going to have a really, really high success rate. Next is going to be the veneer prep. Very minimally invasive. We only work on enamel in these cases. Some cases, I understand you're not going to be just working on enamel because they're going to be a little bit more invasive, but they're always going to be as minimally invasive as possible. You can see that the facial reduction was very, very minimal in all of these cases. So that's something that you want to show the patient. We take a good photograph of this too, and it's really, really, really simple to prep all these veneers. The reason for that is because you have a guide. So there's really nothing you, we can mess up because the guide is there to lead us to know exactly how much reduction we're going to need and the patient's going to be happy the lab is going to be happy everyone's going to be happy so the final step is going to be the impressions so taking a high quality impression is very important 
So I use Splash Max for my impressions. It's a hydrophilic material. If we have a little bit of moisture, it's not a problem. You're still gonna get a really, really good impression. And we also wanna have a perfect bite registration. So I love using Vanilla Bite. Vanilla Bite sets really quickly. You just have the patient open and close a few times and then have them open and close one more time with the bite registration in place. So that's gonna give us high quality impressions. It's gonna give us good bite registration and the lab is gonna be able to deliver some great veneers. So you can see in this photograph, the amount of reduction that was done is very, very minimal. Everything is always on the enamel and there's no anesthetic use in this case. The reason for that is again, it's very superficial. It's pretty much just polishing. And if you can see in the back, this is really almost the only burr that I use, a fine red burr. And the reason for that is because we, we want to just be really minimally invasive. We don't need any of those coarse diamond burrs. The reason for that is because we're just prepping very, very, very little. So after we prep, we get some veneers. This is from that first case that we saw. These are lithium disilicate veneers. We do a try-in on the patient. So we try the veneers in. If everything sets, we take a picture of it or we show the patient with the mirror. Always make sure that there's someone in there with them so they actually see the, the veneers with them too, not just themselves. And after they approve them, then we go ahead and, and bond it. So we use ultra bond. So why do we care about our technique? Why do we care about having a high quality lab do our crowns, do our veneers? And the reason for that is because we can go from this to this. So this is a patient that came to my office. She had some seric veneers and not that there's anything wrong with seric crowns or seric veneers, but as dentists, we can treat and plan something that's definitely going to be a lot better than this. So the patient came to my office because her veneers kept falling off. You can see that this veneer actually fell off so many times that a crown was actually done to try to hold that in place, but it still fell off. So why does this happen? Why does this occur? And this happens because we don't have a proper treatment plan. When we have proper treatment planning, we can go from this to this. This case was done with our technique as well, but unfortunately the, the teeth were reduced so much already that there's really not much we could reduce. So we didn't reduce anything any, anymore. We did do a little bit of a gingivectomy with that trial smile and we were able to accomplish something like this. So this is the smile that we got the same patient in just a few weeks. So to recap everything, this is gonna be the additive reductive template technique, a Lumineer video. So this is gonna show you all the way from step one to the final step. So the patient is gonna walk in that same day. We're gonna do the trial smile that we already did. We're gonna actually use the art templates so we can prepare the teeth, minimally invasive, and we can go ahead and the patient's gonna walk out with a trial smile that's actually bonded this time, okay? So the second time that you do the trial smile, we're gonna use those as provisionals, as temporaries. So the patient's gonna walk out with those. They're gonna be bonded. So you can see at the end how that spot etching is done and how it's bonded. And the patient's gonna be very happy because they're gonna be walking away with what it looks like veneers. Again, you're gonna see that this patient was not numbed, okay? So no anesthetic was used because everything's just gonna be on the enamel.
that shows you how simple preparing for veneers is when you have proper treatment planning by using the additive reductive template technique. So it's really, really, really fast. There really should be no fear for preparing any veneers because everything is done for you already. You have that guide, you do minimal invasive preparations, and you know that you're gonna have a quality aesthetics. So if we send this to the lab, that impression to the lab, they're gonna send us back some great lumineers. Everything's gonna be exactly how the patient expected, only it's gonna be a lot nicer because now we're using a high quality material, not just acrylic or for our temporaries.